Uh, all right, we're going to get started back up again. Uh, last slot before lunchtime. Uh, we have with us Lucas Kraus, and he's going to talk about uh, microservices, theory, and application. All right, uh, let's see. So, uh, microservices, theory, and application. This is a great talk because uh, you, you get it, when you get to talk about theory, architecture, and microservices, those are, you know, it's a buzzword in, in our industry. It's the big new thing. Everyone's talking about it. Everyone says they're doing it. Um, but how do you really, how do you really uh, understand this? And I want to walk through my own personal experience with this. As a practitioner, uh, I work for Magenic. And uh, I had such a frustrating time. So I've been consulting for probably about 10 years over the last 15 years of my, uh, my experience. Uh, I worked in private sector. I used to work for Microsoft internally, left that, started my own business. I uh, went back to consulting because, uh, you know, I always need to do creative things and I always need to help solve really complex problems. And just working at one place for so long uh, doesn't really help. So consulting, seeing people in all the different industries, financial, healthcare, medical, government even, uh, it's just uh, you kind of get an, an idea for the commonalities between all of the different areas where, um, where you work and how computers are kind of the same everywhere. But uh, the problems are very similar, but also the problems are kind of unique uh, for each industry. And so um, microservices is kind of like a rebirth of this. Um, I've been doing microservices for probably over 10 years with a lot of, just not calling it that, was SOA, um, but SOA that would actually work, so you wouldn't really call it SOA. And that's the challenge with it. It's like um, we come up with these things, and then when you give them a name, People grab onto it like a religion sometimes, and it's like a fight. Uh, microservices is no different. I wrote a book, actually, uh, and put it out there, just kind of collecting the patterns and uh, applications for microservices, mostly because my clients, uh, I'd be giving talks all the time and kind of describe, this is nothing really new. Um, and I'll get into more details about why it's different this time and how it's growing and how you can be part of the revolution, right? The revolution of microservices. Uh, so if you get a chance, you know, you can check out this book. It's, it's a little more detailed um, with the patterns and stuff, but it's changing so quickly that, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the best frameworks and ways of doing things is constantly changing. And you can have a big impact on, on how things uh, develop over time. So it's a really exciting time right now. So here's an agenda, rough outline. So uh, I'm going to introduce you guys to the architecture, just kind of get an idea for, you know, level set. I'm sure we've all kind of heard, we all kind of have some ideas. Um, and then we're going to move on to an approach to success. And you, you know, you can read the slide just as well as I can. Basically, the theory side of this is more like, what, what is the point of it? What can you get from it? Uh, what are the pros and cons? Just like with any architecture, when you choose something, there's always trade-offs. When you go to do something in the real world, when you go to the client site and they say, you have to use VB6, right? You have to use COBOL. Um, that's what we, our business is based on. Can you still use some of these theories and approaches to success you know, for, for helping them solve their problem at the end of the day, helping them deliver software and hopefully make it maintainable and hopefully make it secure? Uh, but really, you know, when you're a consultant and you go talk to someone, you're basically saying, you know, your first question is, what are your goals? And, uh, and then from there, you map out your path to success. And you kind of break it to your client, you know. What, what do you need to get there? And uh, how can you succeed? And what have you tried? And what, what has failed? And so when, when you do consulting in software, uh, lots of times I'm the lone coder on a project. Sometimes I'm leading a team of 20 people. It just kind of depends and you fit in where you need to be to solve the problem. But it's interesting is when you talk about software architecture and every company does it their own way. And uh, there's a lot of uh, bad news with architecture. There's a lot of good news. Um, I'm really excited about architecture because uh, when, I, <clears throat> when I first got into software development consulting and in industry, I always thought this uh, concept of software architecture and design patterns was kind of new. And so, um, I was really excited when design patterns, you know, I read the Gang of Four, uh, I saw how this stuff was implemented, there's patterns of enterprise architecture books, there's papers on patterns, 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 um, what does it all mean, where did it come from, and the Gang of Four seems like the seminal book of, of our, you know, of our industry. Um, the Timeless Way of Building by Christopher Alexander, 
This is in the 70s, and this guy is not a software architect. He was a building architect. And uh, this book really paved the way for software architecture in a lot of ways. Um, the Gang of Wars model in a lot of ways that this book models uh, architectural patterns for building architecture. And granted, software and buildings are a little different, and it's kind of a paradigm, but if you go back and read this book, it's a really good book to read if you're into history and architecture. Uh, the whole point of it is patterns are about communicating. And there's another book you wrote after this called um, Patterns Language, and it's, it's a fascinating series of books, and it's not really about software, but you can apply it to anything in life. But when you get into more of the architecture and you get more into the point of patterns, it's to communicate. So I can talk to you and say, we should do a visitor pattern. And if you know what that is, you could say, oh yeah, that, you know, that might make sense. It's a higher level discussion. And so that's really cool. Um, but yeah, check it out. Christopher Alexander was a um, really, really awesome author. And by the way, in his book, um, it's pretty long, you know, a couple hundred pages, but he actually bolded um, parts of the text through the book. And he says, if all you have is about an hour and a half to read, and you don't have a whole day or two to spend reading this book, just read the bold parts and skip everything else. And uh, you can actually read this whole book in about a couple hours. And uh, I wish more books would do that, because in our, in our Twitter age, people just don't have the, the time to really dive in. But then as you're reading through this book, you can dive in deeper where you kind of get into more of uh, the areas that you know, it might apply to help you solve your problems. So. <clears throat> So I already talked about architecture, communication, and patterns. Standardization and goals is another big part of architecture. So um, the whole point is you all agree to what you're doing and the design of what you're doing to meet a goal. And it may be right, it may be wrong, but you want to agree, you want to standardize so that the level of, of conversation is just a higher level. You want that higher level conversation of understanding. Uh, it just kind of makes, makes your chance of success higher. Um, or at least knowing failing faster. And so uh, that's enough about architecture for now. Um, so monoliths, all right, monolithics, monoliths. Uh, the term monolith referenced in the book, The Art of Unix Programming, basically pretty much what, you know, what almost any piece of software you write for long enough ends up becoming. It's inevitable, um, the, big, the big bowl of spaghetti or whatever you want to call it. The thing is it's, it's kind of painful, but it, it can work. Um, it's been working. It's what our industry is kind of built on, you could say. Um, you have the ivory architects dictating a really purist system, but they can't really ever build anything useful. And then you got the guy writing in Excel or something that actually gets the job done. There's this impedance mismatch between these. Um, but it's finally coming to a head because as, as uh, languages mature, as industries mature, uh, we come to a, a commonality, you know, an agreement that monoliths are typically kind of bad because as they grow and get more unmaintainable, the cost of maintenance outpaces the, the benefit that it's really giving. Uh, so you get to a point where to add a feature, it could take a year instead of a month, and it's just uh, not a good way to do business. Uh, <clears throat> so microservices to the rescue. Um, Really, it's like SOA, right? You break apart your business into contexts. Uh, you try to do a bounded context per service. This is domain-driven design nomenclature from Eric Evans' uh, book on domain-driven design. Um, it can kind of mean different things to different people. You really need to have an understanding of what you're building. That's what it comes down to. And so, uh, you know, your business analysts, your usability people, um, your product owners, you really need to understand that. And so you see a lot of people migrate from a monolith to a microservice simply because the monolith de described and solved the problem, hopefully, and it somewhat works. And so you can maybe carve out chunks of that and actually then grow that into this microservice architecture. There's, there's a process there. Doing greenfield microservices is a real challenge. Uh, only because usually the first version or two, I mean, even Microsoft took three times to get something right, usually. Um, so, you know, by the time you get to the, to the monolith, you kind of know what it is, you can carve it out, but at that point, a lot of the decisions have been made, so your hands are tied. And so refactoring into microservices, it's, it's a common thing, I've seen it done a lot. Um, 
Usually what it is is you, you pull a piece out that needs a new feature and you slowly add on more and more services and it's, it's a slower migration. Uh, most of my clients are very large enterprise businesses and so they kind of have uh, a systemic, a systemic uh, large use base of their applications. They can't just rewrite it all from the ground up. Uh, and so this migration strategy works to really align with business goals. And um, I've seen a lot of uh, the coolness with the, the third aspect here, the technology agnostic nature of microservices is if you are truly breaking apart your bounded context and things are truly isolated and independent, and we'll get into the principles later of microservices, but basically if you can follow most of these principles and isolate your business problem, then you can write it in any technology you want. Um, <laughs> the downside is, of course, that you have a big business and you're standardizing your architecture and you're choosing your languages very intentionally so that you don't have some guy writing something in some obscure language that solves a problem and then the rest of the company is like, oh, that guy quit, now what do we do with this thing? So you need this maintainability and you need this maturity. But the exciting thing is with, this, with uh, being able to use any technology, you can see how something would work and maybe do a prototype, uh, maybe do a new, a new react, reaction to the industry or a pivot to a different kind of business model um, using microservices and using better technology so you can't say, well, our hands are tied, we all have to use COBOL um, or even C Sharp or .NET or Java uh, and you can move to the Scala or uh, Elixir or some of the new functional exciting languages coming out or Rust even uh, sounds really cool as well. That talk was great uh, from the last talk. Um, but really I want to say with the architecture is um, microservices is what SOA should have been. SOA just became a behemoth with large enterprise service buses and really buying into a, a business server more than anything. Um, so a lot of the things that SOA had and microservices share, there's a big overlap there, but there is a distinct difference in that they're really at lighter weight. And I'll get to why, why and how this is, is happening really, uh, at least from my perspective. Um, so yeah, so let's talk about the principles here. So we've got encapsulation. Some of these are, are bolded. Encapsulation is very important for a microservice, I believe. If you're not encapsulating well, you're not really isolated. Uh, Domain-centric, that kind of goes with encapsulation as well. You need, you want to be as focused as you can on your specific problem. Independent, fail-safe, I mean, those are the main ones. Automation, decentralized, observable, those are important more for the DevOps side of the table. And uh, it'd be really hard to really do microservices without the holistic team, and, and we'll get into that more later. But a lot of these principles, if you can adhere to many of these principles, and these have been beaten to death in many different books, um, but the idea is you, you try to stay true to these principles, and then you can reap the benefits of the microservices architecture. And so, uh, so we wouldn't be anywhere without what is the main point of microservice architectures. Usually it is for scalability. And the scale cube here in the Art of Scalability, this great book, uh, essentially you kind of have your X, Y, Z axes. And the idea is you would decompose your functions um, by separating them by things that they do differently. And so that's your, your bounded context or your business domains. So essentially, you kind of have a shopping cart order e-commerce system. Your fulfillment, your order management, your shopping cart, you know, pre-order, those could all be bounded contexts and different um, things. And so by making those all separate microservices, you can essentially scale those out independently of each other. And then you're really, you're saving money, you're saving overhead, uh, you're making deployment easier, uh, theoretically. Um, and so that is where this uh, approach really makes sense. And these other, so first you scale on the y-axis, and then you can scale any one of those out by the x, which is just duplicating and, and spreading out your clusters, or z by you know, sharding your data or whatever. Uh, really the first approach with a microservice architecture is by business domain if, if possible, and a lot of this coming from monoliths can be a challenge. And so that's why a lot of people may be doing microservices, but um, it, it can be a, uh, a rocky road, so to speak. Okay, so um, one more thing on the philosophy of microservices. I love philosophy. Uh, I believe 
that if you understand the philosophy and the history of things, uh, it kind of gives you the best intent for what the intended purpose or point of something is. And so then you can go ahead and take that and you don't really need to keep checking in with a checklist or a magical guide. You can say, does this really follow the philosophy, the point of it, and is it something that we should even be doing? And you can align this with your organizational structure or your values as a company or the, the way the business operates. And if you're gonna be fighting that philosophy with, with your organization, maybe it's not the best thing to do right now. Maybe you can show by example the value. Um, but the philosophy of, of Unix, really, um, a lot of these Unix core utilities do one thing and do it well, um, break things down into fine-grained focused services. Uh, it's a philosophy that has served well. Unix has been around a very long time, and it runs the it really runs the world. And uh, that I don't think it would be near as effective or scalable or um, secure as if it didn't really do that. And who knows where it would be without that. Uh, microservices builds on that concept, that philosophy, and it's uh, so, you know, nothing is really new uh, in this respect. Um, there's been a big shift in the industry uh, over the last decades uh, to maintainability. Um, the cost of hardware is dropping, the cost of memory is dropping, uh, the cost of people is skyrocketing. So the bottleneck is the people, uh, not the hardware. And if you remember back in the day when there were refrigerator-sized computers and you were eking out every bit, or the, uh, you know, the Apollo uh, Land Rover module, right? Like, you optimize every little bit on that. Um, so you spend hours and hours and hours on that. The shift in our industry is to maintainability. You want code to be maintainable. You need code to, uh, to be maintainable mostly because it's cost and businesses need money, and that's the bottom line. And so while you may be able to write software and, and do what you want, you need to maintain profitability. You need to be smart about the way you do things. And by shifting the focus to maintainability, which means writing fine-grained, very focused, domain-centric microservices, you focus more on the business problem, and it's very maintainable at that point because it's modular. Um, and there's some trade-offs with this, of course, uh, which our tooling will solve, and I'll get into that later. But basically, as time goes on, this is only going to be exacerbated, and so it's, it's really interesting um, to kind of see that change because I remember learning assembly and tweaking every last bit of, of code that could fit into, uh, into our memory allocations, and then basically now it's, well, who really cares? Um, you should still care about the size of your programs, don't get me wrong, but maintainable code, I think, is, is more important than prematurely optimized code, let's just say that. Um, but it really depends on what you're doing and what you're solving. And for uh, most business applications in the enterprise, maintainability is the key. Um, obviously, if you're building a low-level game engine or something like that, maintainability is important, but performance is also very important. So you gotta understand your audience, you gotta understand your goals. Um, but generally, as an industry and software, uh, we're shifting to maintainability. And then solid and dry development principles, um, a lot of that has to do with object-oriented design, and we're kind of moving more to a functional world as well, so, you know, dry and solid. Some of these align with the foundations. Dry, not so much, because um, duplication is usually a side effect of microservices, uh, but you gotta choose, choose your duplication wisely in many cases. There's always trade-offs. Uh, and that moves on to the next uh, focus, which is the Sea change, the time is ripe. Uh, why is this happening now? Why did it take 10, 15 years for SOA to really mature and kind of rebrand itself and focus on simplicity? And really, you, it comes down to automation, containers, DevOps. Uh, every generation thinks you know, that, that these problems have never been solved before, and so they try to solve them themselves, stumble on some novel solutions. Um, having an open mind to uh, these higher level abstractions. And the cloud is also responsible for some of this. Um, the ability to maintain and manage thousands of services running, you know, is just a nightmare for ops. Uh, production issues aside, logging, dealing with all the data. Big data was the big thing in the 210, 212s, you know, all this data flowing in, what do we do with it? Um, it's a sea change with, you know, all these forces coming together. And we have yet to really unify and have a, a good standard. Standards will emerge, uh, frameworks will emerge, 
And you know, it's really kind of a Darwinian uh, evolution in, in a respect, but you know, impacted with the 10X improvement in technology. So it's a really good time to be in this industry, really exciting. Uh, I can only imagine what the next five, 10 years will bring us. Um, but this is really what has enabled microservices to really come to the forefront. And that's why it's a buzzword right now. And it's, it's a good thing for conferences and for talking about things, but when you're trying to do things, it, it can be very cloudy and confusing and just another buzzword. Are you doing microservices? Yeah, we're doing microservices. You know, what does that mean? Um, why is that important? Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a good time to be a developer and it's a good time to, to look into microservices and see, you know, do these patterns, do these architectures really apply to help you solve your problems? Uh, so that's what it comes down to, these patterns and approaches. Um, these are very uh, interesting. CQRS, I'm not sure if you guys know much about that. Um, separating reads from writes is what that comes down to. Event sourcing is, is another one. I'll get into the more details on some of these, uh, these approaches. Not saying they're right or wrong, but they exist. I've used a lot of these in a lot of ways, and I've been successful in, in most of my attempts. API gateway proxy orchestrated API. Uh, when you think of microservices, this is probably what will come up to the list of how you do a microservice. And is this true? No, no, you don't have to use any of these. You want to do a microservice, just do a TCP server. I mean, it's as old as, you know, uh, really old transactional processing systems. Even COBOL, you could do microservices if you really wanted to. Um, it's technology agnostic. Um, but a lot of these help you reap the benefits of maintainability and help you reap the benefits of uh, integrity and avoiding distributed transactions by designing your system around like an event source system. API gateway and proxy is a way to abstract out some of the complications of security or uh, service discovery and registration and things like that. Orchestrated API is a, a little more micromanaged way of doing these things. Um, these are emerging and kind of Coming in, into and out of fashion, uh, they're tools in the toolbox, really, in, in my opinion. And um, if anything, CQRS is more of like a, a teaching pattern to say, you don't have to do reads and writes in the same operation. You can optimize your reads, you know. Uh, you can look at it like when big data came, it was all about, oh, well, it's really a read-only data source, so do we really, do we really care uh, about optimizing for updates when, uh, all we're doing is just aggregating and reading this data and, and doing analysis on it. And so that really opened the eyes to a lot of people with um, these concepts where you, you, know, you can't separate. But there's a lot of work with the frameworks and a lot of work with the languages where uh, to really break apart at this level, I mean, there's so many ways of doing these things. Um, but this is a good, a good teaching pattern for just breaking the ice and saying, hey, you don't, you don't have to do it all in, in one go. And event sourcing is really, really valuable because um, a lot of things are, are based on an event sourcing system that you may not even realize the value of it, but a lot of people, it's conceptually hard to get through. And not saying it fits every problem, but certain problems, you know, it should fit. Um, it, should, it should work well for you, uh, depending on, you know, it depends on exactly what your situation is. But a lot of these are really uh, interesting um, approaches. So that's kind of a, a rough intro to where this talk is going. Uh, intro to architecture, there was some, some stuff I'm going to get into more details in the application part of the technologies and security. Um, but basically that's, that's kind of the ground level intro. If you wanted more information, there's, there's some pretty good books on microservices now. I have the book and there's a, a couple other ones that are pretty decent. Uh, and so uh, we're going to move on to approach to success. So really, I mean, what's the point of, it, of doing anything really? It's to deliver value. To be successful, you got to measure that. And so I'm going to walk through just stating it and being in, in, intentful, you know, having an intent for it. Um, you may not actually think or know why you're doing any one thing. You just kind of do it just to do it. Um, but usually success is defined as um, to get to being successful uh, is, you know, you got to understand the business. Um, you should understand the organizational structure of the team. And if you don't have an explicit structure designed for success, then you're kind of leaving that up to chance. Um, the size, size of the code, size of the team, what does it mean? Does it matter? And technology, does it fit the goals? Um, so if you have a goal to deliver something and you can take on a bunch of technical debt, then you know, go ahead and do that, acknowledging you're going to take on technical debt to do something, or maybe use a, a brand new language to try to prototype something. Uh, 
you got to have business buy into this, though, and you need business to understand it. Um, and so a lot of this ties into success. It's not about the technology. It's, it's not rather just about the technology. It's really a holistic thing. And uh, the more you look holistically at systems and things, it just makes more sense. So design, define success for you. Um, what do you look at something successful? I mean, personally, for me, it's, you know, I, I want no defects. Obviously, you know, that, that's a lofty goal in a lot of respects, but something should do what it does, right, what it should do, and that's usually what business needs it to do. Uh, meets the needs of the users. That's a very important one, too. Um, your product owners may not really know, but if the users don't use it, you know, that's another metric unto itself. Um, sometimes being secure is, is, is required, required. Scalable, robustness, easy to maintain. The users, meets the needs of the users, you could also say meet the, the needs of the teams, really. So, you know, in microservices, your team structure should usually be a holistic end-to-end -end team of QA, product management, developers, QA, release engineers, all working together front to back in that sense because they, they own the team, they own the business, they own the problem, they own the service. That sense of ownership really has a cohesive bind that, that ties the team together. And I've seen so many projects fail where you know, things get stuck in limbo where the devs just throw stuff over the wall or uh, the testers are testing stuff that doesn't align with actually what the business scenarios require. And so, you know, you, gotta, you should be very intentional when you're choosing architectures, when you're designing systems to outline what success is, actually write it out, uh, align it to the values of your company. A little short exercise of doing this uh, really calls out risks and can call out issues down the road. Uh, it's never, being intentional has never really hurt anything. And if anything, it can help you realize things that you just take for granted that maybe you should question. Um, the biggest ones I would say are on budget and on time from a, a business user standpoint. Uh, for the technology side, success could be, you know, um, being engaged in a technology, learning a new language like Go or Rust. Uh, that could be success as saying, we're gonna implement something in this new language and try it out and see how it works. Challenging all of our assumptions and challenging our, our business constraints. Uh, it just really depends. But it's an exciting time and it's, it's not that expensive to branch out and kind of do an experiment with new things either. <clears throat> so how do you understand the business? I mean, this, um, this is more of microservices talk, not uh, requirements gathering talk or use case scenarios and things like that. But, you know, typically the process, you break problems down into manageable parts. There's usually some kind of a life cycle, agile, scrum, waterfall, scrum, fall, whatever you want to call it. Uh, use cases, stories, scenarios. The biggest aspect in the last five, 10 years has been usability, human computer interaction, uh, touch interfaces, mobile has changed a lot of things. And so a lot of these old ways of doing things uh, don't take into account usability. And now, you know, the barrier to entry with any kind of customer facing application is to understand user interaction and to make your users happy and to make their life easier. So if they're doing an operation with a list of items, you know, 20 items, and they gotta go one at a time through, and you're like, can I do a batch change, you know? Things like that, like, just make your life easier for, for your customers. And the last one is really interesting is this API economy, where a lot of businesses are focused now just on, on APIs as a business model, and it's really fascinating. And I've even seen large, uh, large corporate entities have their own teams almost sell their own products internally. So instead of a cost center, it's more of like a way to justify the financial needs of each department. So while you may be doing internal tools at your business, um, it's a cost center, yeah, and there's not much value in it. It's not as shiny as maybe the commercial products that ship. But if you apply the API economy, you can basically say, hey, you should go in and um, put some value on this and charge other groups. I mean, some corporates or corporations are so large, I mean, they need to do that and they bill each other and it's this huge internal uh, gridlock process. But you know, there is some value in, in showing that you know, all of it is interdependent, all of it is important, and it's all for success of, of the business, of, the, of earning money or uh, mind share, et cetera. And so moving over to organizational structure, um, this ties into Conway's law, exactly what uh, many other presentations have talked about. Communication structures of organizations, software design tends to mirror that. And it's kind of fascinating 
in a train wreck kind of way, when you see dysfunctional patterns in an organization, how that can cripple uh, software development and processes. And there's all these large, you know, all these statistical numbers of number of projects that fail and why they fail and all that kind of interesting things. Um, the key here though is you should be aware of this and the good thing is if you keep your team small with uh, microservices and you focus on a small business problem and you can be successful. Um, what you might run into though is this uh, issue called the S second system effect in the uh, Mythical Man Month uh, book. There's a collection of essays and one of them is second system effect where version one, just to get shipped, they cut all the extra fluff that doesn't need to be there, they ship it, and then version two needed to have everything version one should have had and then all the stuff version two should have had and then it inevitably fails because you know basically um, they oversaturated it. And so that's a law that they found uh, in, in technology systems. And so Scrum solved that problem by saying iterate early, iterate often, release every week. And, uh, but simplicity is key with patterns and that, that's a, a very big thing. So dry, it's, it's a good object-oriented pattern but typically you don't want duplicate things. Duplication is, is the death knell for most systems but in microservices it can make sense. And solid is generally pretty good principles for object-oriented design. In functional systems, there would be some different patterns because those are kind of built in with immutable structures and things like that. Um, but just be aware of this, and hopefully you can identify these problems and, and escalate before it becomes an issue. Uh, but it's just a fascinating corollary where organization structure and software design communication, they would mirror each other. It's, it's just kind of odd that that would actually happen. Okay, so how big should a team be, team size? Um, I would say, personally, my teams have never been more than you know, 10, 10 to 12 people, um, really depending on what you're doing. Uh, we had a, a stack with Android devs, iOS devs, and you got some API service guys, and you got some database backend uh, guys, you got ops, you got QA, all that was about 20 people. Development team, Amazon says two pizza-sized teams, two large pizza-sized teams, so who you can feed on with two large pizzas. I don't know, some of these engineers can eat so much pizza, I, I'm not really sure if that's, that's a good metric for that, but really what it should be is you want a team that you have high trust in, you have low process, there's no handoff between the life cycle, and just not too big, and it's one of those things where you would see it when you know it, when, and it really can depend on the people too. If you have all 18 players that over communicate and are all on the same page, and you have a bunch of them, it, you know, it could be really effective. Um, but typically there is, there is gonna be a bottleneck though with a microservice where you can only have so many chefs in the kitchen. So you wouldn't have you know, 50 guys on one project uh, developing this. Um, if, if that's the case and that's what you're doing, you probably should break it down in, into more uh, smaller focused teams. Um, but really it depends on, on your organization, on your structure and how that all works. But, uh, but yeah, there, there's a lot of discussion on this, and um, it's, it's always an interesting discussion. Uh, okay, and then moving on to technology stack. So, <clears throat> so what should you use to build a microservice? You know, what is some good prescriptive guidance? I'm a big fan of event-based, you know, immutable message passing languages like Erlang, Elixir, Scala, um, functional languages that kind of, uh, they, they benefit the architecture. Uh, they make it easier to do event sourcing in, in CQRS because the data doesn't change. Multi-threading multi and scalability kind of come with the frame, with the language. Uh, the problem is, you know, there's a lot of Java shops, there's a lot of .NET shops, and they're not all going to become Elixir, you know, experts. Um, but, you know, depending on the problem space you're solving in that, uh, using these where your problem fits can reap enormous benefits, and it can help educate and elevate the team if you see that. So if you make an investment in this, in these, these kind of newer event-based immutable languages, um, it, microservices is a great fit for that because it can be isolated as more of an experiment. Uh, graph databases are really cool, Neo4j, OrientDB, et cetera. Um, search optimized indexes, Lucene Solar, Java.NET Node, Go, Rust, Julian, whatever. You can use really whatever you want the beauty is based on your business problem, you can kind of choose the best technologies for that problem, isolate them and put them together and see how that works. Uh, and chances are your efficiency, you know, the first 
one or two versions of, of doing something new and in, in, in new framework or you know hiring a new team and, and trying something out um, it could be worth it it will most likely be worth it because based on the business problem domain uh, certain languages fit better for certain kinds of problems and so uh, really you should take a really close look at that don't don't dismiss it only because oh you're not going to go use the latest newest fad language to do something in uh, you need to really align with organizational uh, architectural guidance in a sense that you want everyone on the same page to agree but there's a lot of value in this and the beauty is you know um, as a technology practitioner you can really get to learn new things uh, it makes things interesting change it up and you can kind of see what you're gaining and what you're losing with each one of these um, technology choices and it, it, overall it kind of makes for a better system because you know what your alternatives are if you never even knew things existed or never even tried it you know you never know you could it could be the future in, in five or 10 years. You gotta take a longer term approach on some of these systems because they could be around for 20 years. And doing something that is, you know, five lines of code versus like 6,000 lines of code because it's a functional language and you get this message passing and immutability and it's just uh, more scalable, uh, things like that. Um, the benefits can, can outweigh the negatives, but you really gotta do that, that pro-con list. And then really, um, how do you partition, let's say you have a monolith and you got a lot of complexity, you know, what are the partitioning strategies? Typically, you know, by verb or use case, by noun or resource, grouping things that change together in an easier way, but riskier. So how do you kind of group and draw these bounded contexts? That is really the big inhibiting factor to, I think, what a successful microservices architecture implementation would be is the business side of it, uh, because we're, down in the weeds trying to turn this requirement into code and there's so many constraints and sometimes even the data model you don't have much control over and so there's patterns that can help with that, there's approaches that can help with that. Um, single responsibility principle though is, is the big one where really you should look at things at a responsibility level and say you should really focus on one thing, try to do just one thing and if you can't really think about why that is and maybe you can find an underlying issue with uh, the whole approach to the business. So there's lots of options here. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna move over to the benefits. So what are the benefits of microservices? Uh, performance is, is one of them. Um, mostly, it's like a long-term benefit. Uh, there could be a slow ramp up to get going with uh, designing these systems and and getting the kinks ironed out with ops and all that kind of stuff. But the general performance is you can scale these things out pretty easily. Uh, if you pick one of these functional languages, they're, they're probably pretty verbose and, and pretty, pretty easy to understand once you get to that level. And over time, your ROI will increase, your time to market will increase. Uh, because you can iterate faster, you don't have to, because the problems with SOA that, that we had was Basically, you, you get this huge mesh of services and then you have these, these horizontal slices that would cut through and do like security or some kind of aspect logging or tracing or something like that. And then you have this huge service bus and these large XML-based messages that would be passing around. And the idea was, you know, siloed, siloed information in these services. And I don't want to say this is really siloed in a sense that these are more of like business components not really siloed front to back, but encapsulated. And so the performance is generally bigger because you're focusing on this one problem and making that work. Uh, so it's, it's faster typically in, in execution in the code. You can pick a technology that actually fits the problem space is designed for. And so you're not using like a Mongo database as a relational database or something like that. And, um, and so another benefit is you can meet higher uh, meet high user expectations through this architecture. People expect things to be robust. People expect things to be scalable. Uh, nowadays, you can't re really release faulty software in this day and age. Uh, you know, things are perpetually in beta mode now. And it's, it's one of those very kind of confusing things that people release stuff in beta. And what does beta really mean? It's, it's one of these quasi quality things. Um, so people have very high expectations in usability in user experience and human-computer interaction. 
but in, you know, things just working. And then the last one, which I think is the biggest one, and this falls into the domain-driven design, is the ubiquitous language. So you want a very specific language in your microservices just for that microservice, purposefully probably different from other microservices so you don't pollute it. But you, know, you, can, share, you can share common, common language core concepts, um, but if you have a ubiquitous language around your business problem, that really, and that goes in with patterns as well. Patterns is kind of like a ubiqui ubiquitous language for architecture. You can say this ubiquitous language is in your business objects and domains. Uh, but it really depends on the complexity with what you're dealing with and your ability to change uh, the underlying structure of, of how that stuff works. And there's some more, more benefits here. We've got faster deployments, uh, easier to test really as a whole, uh, cheaper to scale, and the fault isolation. You kind of know when something goes bad what it is if you got a really fine-grained service that goes down. Uh, when you see those dependency, uh, depend dependency graphs where you, know, you get a lot of interdependencies on your services, it may, you know, it would be no worse than the, than, the, uh, than the monolith in that sense because the monolith would be broken as well. At least in the microservices, it's, it's very clear what is breaking. And when you migrate a monolith to a microservice, it may be a little hard breaking those contexts out. So if there are some interdependencies that you can't get rid of, that you need that dependency on, at least you know exactly where it is, when it is. And, but the real benefit here is the, the scalability and the deployment. So if only one part of your application is a bottleneck, you can scale that one piece out. In a monolith, you would have to scale the entire thing, which could be very expensive. And uh, we've all been down that path, I'm sure, um, seeing you know, virtual machine after virtual machine of, of entire systems, or even the ones that don't do transactions right, and then you end up with a lot of duplicate data when they attempt to scale it. And so uh, there's a lot of those problems. So these are the benefits, but you know, benefits wouldn't be benefits without you know, some kind of opposites, which in this case would be the challenges. Uh, there's more complexity in distributed systems. Um, you're never gonna get away from that, uh, but I think our industry is really elevating to a point where you, know, you get a lot more asynchronous programming now. People understand asynchronous programming, people understand distributed systems a little more. Uh, you know, JavaScript programmers and you got closures and you've got a lot of these functional languages coming into the mix. Um, there's more complexity in, in distributed systems compared to the, the old school way of doing things was object oriented or you know, um, RPC and those kinds of systems. So there's more complexity, but I, I think we can deal with it, especially in this day and age with all the resources and the internet at our disposal. Uh, but you need to understand there is complexity. And systems testing can be a challenge because of interdependency. So if you have interdependency of microservices or you're trying to test a, a whole of them and each of these are their own autonomous teams, then, then how do you kind of oversee all of that and make sure they all play nicely? And what I've seen with system testing that really helps is having really well-defined interfaces on the front ends of things. So you have an API, you have uh, some kind of a contract there. And this has worked really good with like native to API to service mappings. So native devices, you know, you work with iOS, you work with Android, you work out those interfaces ahead of time, they implement it however they need to implement it on their devices, but basically you get that interface signed off with, you know what you're talking to and expecting, and then inside the microservice, it's really just an abstraction. So they don't really care what we do as long as we do it right. Uh, you know, we can do whatever we want as long as we return the data that we need and if we have SLAs that we meet those SLAs. Uh, and another challenge here, uh, distributed transactions. This is typically solved with event sourcing systems or eventual consistency. Um, sometimes you need distributed transactions if you're migrating from, from a monolith. Uh, you will have interdependencies and it will be one of those things you wean off of your system. The goal is to get rid of it completely. It's kind of, uh, it's, it's showing a broken model, uh, a misaligned model when you do this. Um, so, you know, you can't, you can't always get rid of them completely, but you should try to avoid them. Uh, they're really not worth it. And you may realize your data, your data doesn't really matter with the consistency at any point in time, just as long as it's eventually consistent. Um, you might find that that works. And this has worked at banks. This has worked at healthcare companies. Uh, really the things you would think that, oh, you couldn't, you could not use a distributed transaction in. Um, actually you can, uh, but you kind of got to change your mindset a little. And then uh, moving on to the challenges, management of the system. This is solved with tooling, but 
there's not really a good tooling story. I mean, there's a lot of options. I think there's almost too many options, and there's, there's more every day. And you get uh, companies like Hootsuite, which has that amazing Voltron app. That was really cool. Um, and I hope to see them open source that, because I'm sure a lot of my customers would love to, to use that for uh, managing microservices. Uh, and then, you know, obviously, higher memory usage. Obviously, if you, if you have duplicate data in microservices, um, you can have higher data, data costs, higher memory. But typically the trade-off is you're, you're getting all these other benefits. The trade-off is you may have a higher memory footprint. Uh, but it really depends on your business problem. And there's some more challenges. We've got organization and culture and general maturity. Um, I'm not sure how many of you have ever tried to write a hypermedia API. Anyone try to do that? Show of hands, anyone? Have you succeeded in writing a hypermedia API? Oh, great, kind of, maybe, sort of. Yeah, that came down to maturity in a lot of my customers. Um, I go there and they're trying to do a hypermedia API and it's like, hey, we're gonna write this hypermedia API. And I look at them and I'm thinking, you are not mature enough. You, you don't know enough about what you don't know, you know, the unknown unknowns or the known unknowns. You don't know, you're not mature enough as an organization, your culture wouldn't match that. So in the same respect of hypermedia APIs, which is a really, really awesome thing, it's just really hard to do right. Uh, organization and cultural challenges with microservices. You wouldn't think technology architectural choices and organization and culture could not mesh, but you know, the Unix philosophy of do one thing and do it well, and your organizational culture is, is very much not that. Um, I'm not really sure how you could be against that other than you know, gold plating and things like that. Uh, but basically, I mean, these are the challenges that you have almost with, with anything, but specifically with microservices because it's, it's buzzword hell, really. Uh, you get into the buzzword, the CTO comes into a meeting, we gotta do microservices, we gotta do it now. And it's like, you don't even know what that means, why are you dictating this? Um, so hopefully, you know, that doesn't happen anywhere that you guys work. Uh, if it does, I feel sorry for you. Um, but hopefully you can educate and, uh, and explain. And um, just be aware that, you know, success is dependent on the greater whole. So while your technology and your service may, may work on your box or even may work within the company, uh, the whole project may not succeed because, you know, overall, uh, it didn't meet usability or security or performance because your release management team or QA or even the business, uh, the, the business owners, product owners were kind of off the mark and you didn't get something in the hands of the users fast enough to iterate and know if you're doing something correctly. Okay, so that's the theory. Um, enough about theory. We're gonna move on to more uh, technology and, and security, more of the application of microservices, uh, diving more into the CQRS and event sourcing, bounded context, things like that. So uh, CQRS, command query responsibility segregation, that's really, really long, confusing words. Separate reads from writes. And then we got event sourcing, we got domain-driven design bounded contexts. Uh, the API gateway is a very, very common pattern. There's a lot of technologies that implement that. And then a language problem space in NoSQL, immutability, statistical, um, depending on what problem space you're in. So CQRS, let's go a little bit into this. Um, it's a really interesting teaching uh, pattern. Uh, basically, as I said, separating reads from writes. It's a good starting point for kind of changing your mindset to understand how, how you can break apart your your program, your, your problem space to, to gain some kind of benefit. And the benefit here is that, you know, your data updates don't really need to be involved with the rights and this is, is the value of it in that, here's a good diagram here. So as you can see, commands would come in. In this case, there's a message broker, message passing. Commands need to go somehow. It could just be a functional call. Uh, I wouldn't say you'd necessarily have a service bus here. That might be overkill. Um, but the general pattern is you have a command for you know, writing or updating something, goes to a microservice. You could have a different service for each one or one service dealing with both, it really kind of depends. Um, but the idea is the one command is only for you know, writing, updating, creating something, changing it, and that's kind of a different, usually a different style of, of data structure and a different kind of optimization need 
than just reading data. And so you pass this command in, it goes in, hits the database, or if you're doing event sourcing down the road, we'll show that. Uh, the query generation is, is different. Um, the query could be a command still, um, but it's, it's a query type in that it's read only. Uh, if you're gonna use message passing, you know, these would probably all be commands, but one would be a query and one would be like doing something. And then in the query, you know, uh, you can optimize and, and index and make things really fast. Uh, the idea is, um, the real idea is, in the case where like you're trying to read reports for something is where this is most, most apparent. So you have this complicated, you know, transactional system with lots of data, and then usually there's a back-end process that will aggregate and then dump data into a bunch of tables. And then you read reports off of that, read your data, and typically that's not very performant uh, when, it's, when it's hitting the transactional database directly. And so in this case, you know, you can optimize your query to show different things in a different structure and there's less of that happening in the middle tier and more of it's happening as a separate independent service. And so the separation of this, um, I will just add that this has really nothing to do with microservices, really. This is really just a pattern for breaking apart reads from writes. You can use this in a monolith if you wanted. And it might be a good thing to do before you migrate a monolith over to a microservice. The goal is kind of separating the logic out so that you can independently optimize each one. Uh, it really fits good in a microservice because as a good first step because it's a very common pattern used in a lot of systems where when you're going to write something, that's a different kind of path than when you're, you're reading and trying to edit stuff and, and view reports or aggregates of things. And the way you do entities and object models or whatever, uh, it just kind of depends. So <clears throat> this is a very, very good pattern for really more of a mindset and less of, you know, you should do this, you know, just to do it, so to speak. <clears throat> There's some value to be added. And it's a good first step. So moving on to event sourcing, uh, I wanna speak a little bit about this because um, I've only used this in, in one of my clients uh, recently and it, it has been successful so far. Um, but you know, there's a lot of confusion with what this is and there's some diagrams here later that I'll get into. But you can look at business designs that require reliability, transparency. So accounting, banking, blockchains uh, like Bitcoin. So the idea is this, um, when you go and you have a bank account and you go and get your, your bank account amount, does it go out to a database and just read straight out, like you have $10,000 or you have 10 bucks? Uh, no, that's, that's an accounting nightmare because that would be an auditing nightmare. And so what you end up doing is you have a ledger and if anyone's taken accounting classes, you know, you know, if you make a mistake in transaction, you don't delete it, you just reverse it, a full reversal or partial reversal, there's kind of different approaches to this. And when you start looking at things like that in that kind of a mindset, um, it makes a lot of sense. The blockchain is the history of all the previous transactions. It's, it's less of a, an event source system than anything, but there is that blockchain showing all the transactions. And if you're gonna undo something or remove something, it just goes down the list. Um, so you get built-in replay as a real good benefit of this. If you're capturing the right data, I mean, that's the dependency. You capture all the right data, which is really hard to do, but if you capture all the right data, then you have this system and you're storing events instead of actual data, and you're storing the events of things. And it's a little bit bigger, but you know, Moore's Law, you know, I think uh, storage is just gonna get bigger and bigger. So that's not so much of a constraint on it. But the idea is, you can replay this. So the idea is, if you had the system from, from the starting point, and you release a version, version two, version three, you can take all of the events in that system that have ever happened and replay them all, and it may take a long time, but it would be a really awesome regression test because you can see the consistency and testing of the data, and it's not just testing state at a point in time, you're really storing facts of things that happened. And so the beauty of an event source system is that you get that replayability. Of course, there's always trade-offs for this. Ordering, reconciliation can be an issue. Uh, you gotta take that into account. But one of the best benefits is the replay. Um, the coolest thing about event sourcing, in my opinion, is that it's secure uh, by nature because essentially everything's sequentially written and you can't just go in and just change something without it being apparent to how it works. And there's lots of, of novel ways of making the system inherently proof. And really what this is, is it's built in auditing as well. So in a lot of, of secure systems that require auditing and high security, event sourcing is a really great way to go, at least for your master data. And that's a good point is I'm talking about master data, not necessarily you know, the day-to-day um, the -day microservice stuff. You can 
You can feed off of this and have subsets of events. But the beauty of this also is you can then, if you find a nugget of truth and a pattern of your events years later, a question you want to ask about how people deposit money in a bank or something like that, you can go back and actually run all your old events through and answer that question from a point in time, you know, from the beginning of the system. Granted that you're capturing that data. And that's, that's the trade-off here is, you know, hindsight's 2020, but it's, it's a really valuable and interesting system and it's a little more complex than, than a lot, but it gives you built-in auditing, gives you a lot of built-in security and transparency. It's very reliable, uh, but the challenges are the size and the challenges is, is uh, reversals and ordering and reconciling if, if you have an issue, if your system is not really uh, designed well uh, from the ground up. And so <clears throat> an event-centric approach for domain models is basically what this is about. So you use commands sent to an aggregate, you're generating events from a command, you apply the aggregate to update the state. So the idea is you're, you're event-based, you store your events in a database, you do some stuff, you save an event in the, in the database, the database is really an event store, and that could really be anything, a distributed database, it could be uh, a message bus, uh, a service bus if you really wanted it to. Um, it could just be really, you know, this doesn't really dictate what it is. You figure out how to store the events, um, and then basically uh, you're using those events to uh, essentially uh, drive the logic in the system. So you're saving events, not object, transient object state. So in the case of like a checking account, uh, you get a checking account object back, that account balance is an integer on an entity, but it's derived via a formula from an event store. And so there's traceability. So let's say you got your checking account number and you're like, hey, uh, you know, there's only a thousand bucks in my account. I, I thought there was 10,000. And they go and they say, no, no, the database says 10,000, you know, what do you want to do? And, you know, that would be open to lawsuits, you know, it's he said, she said, like, what happened here? So, you know, in this system, they say, well, look, from the very point of your account opening, here's every transaction that went through and where it came from, and it's all follow the money, follow the flow, and that gives you reliability in the system knowing, hey, this is fair, this is transparent, I understand it, there's truth in these facts. And so that's the real value of this. Um, so the event store could be a database, a message broker. Um, it, it's really technology agnostic. The idea is you're persisting these events. And then uh, when you're going to update data, so you get the event for an entity. So imagine an entity coming in, you go and get the events for that entity, you apply it to the entity that you have, and then you process a new command like creating more properties, editing things, you save it back with the associated entity to other dependencies. And I'll show some, some example uh, pseudocode here in a minute. Um, so the event store, you got like a, a pub sub bus, subscribe, you know, publish and subscriber. It can kind of be, um, you need a way to pull the events out and, and save events. Pub sub is a very common pattern for that. Some people hate pub sub. Uh, there, there's a lot of issues with a lot of these different kinds of, of messaging patterns and so you need to pick the best one for what you want to do. Um, I would say keep it simple to start out with, but depending on your model and depending on your architecture, it really kind of depends. But an event subscriber is the thing that updates events that it's subscribed to. So the idea is you would subscribe to events and then you can do things based on those. So a very you know, trivial example here would be like a shopping cart and fulfillment ordering system where there's an item count of inventory remaining in a fulfillment center. And you could argue and say, well, should I update the items remaining if it's in a shopping cart? Like if I go to put something in a shopping cart online, should I really make sure there's something in inventory for that? You could say, well, you know, they may never get rid of that. So, it's, you know, the justification of the business case of this is not really thought out that well. But basically, the idea is, you know, if you wanted to update the item remaining and the item count in the cart, the idea is as you add something to the shopping cart, calls update item remaining, the cart has an item count object there. It says cart item remaining updated event. So you're saving that event to the event store. And then fulfillment ordering basically listens for that event and says when a cart item remaining updated event hits, I'm going to pull it in and I'm going to update the inventory item count saying that there's one less because someone added it to the shopping cart. And that could be part of the checkout process, let's say, once they, they check out. Um, but the point being, like, if, if, this was, if this was an account balance change, a deposit comes in, someone listens and it updates its, its uh, corresponding amount. Um, as you kind of see though, you're saving events, you're not really saving entities, 
in, in this database uh, system. But event source basically means though, there's, there is some overhead here. I mean, you're going to the, to the event store, you're pulling the events for something, you're applying them, you're doing some stuff, you're saving those. It could be some pretty big messages going back and forth. Uh, just things to keep into consideration. And so this brings us to really kind of a summary of event sourcing. Um, it's relatively new and unconventional in, in modern systems. Uh, but it's, it's very reliable. It gives you eventual consistency because there's a source of truth. It's really database agnostic. Um, there are issues with implementation, the messaging patterns, how you want to implement this in your services. There's lots of, it depends. And in platforms, I know Chris Richardson had a, a startup, he's working on eventuate.io, which does a lot of these, solves a lot of these problems. And um, I have yet to actually use, use his system, but this is more Java-based, I believe. And uh, it's something to look into as, as our, you know, as we mature as an industry and there's more uh, platforms and frameworks available, so definitely something to look into uh, for experimentation. Um, and you may actually, it may align more with your business problem domain than you would expect. Um, so it's just, it can be surprising that way. Uh, I know when I first came to event sourcing, I never really put it in the context of like an, an accounting or a banking aspect of that. And so uh, understanding that actual uh, example really can help you explain to other people too. People hear event sourcing and they just think, oh, this super complex, crazy thing. CQRS with event sourcing is this really big, complicated, you know, pattern-ish kind of thing. But really, if you if you break it down to the simple concepts, it's it is, it's like most things. It's it's easy in theory, but a little tricky in implementation. So, but there's some frameworks that are coming out to help with that, and uh, maybe you can even build your own framework that would make this easier, or a language. Uh, who knows? Okay, and then back to the bounded context. So we know this book well. Uh, Eric Evans is really great, uh, really great book about object-oriented design with with more of a business. Oh, how much time do I have? Okay. Um, so basically, design is hard. Know your business boundary. Isolate at that boundary. Um, each context will have its own language and. Each language should be very specific. So that's the big takeaway for bounded context is you want them to be specific. And um, moving on to the API gateway, I'm just gonna do a time check here real quick. Okay. Am I over? Oh, okay. Um, I'll just quickly go through this here, a uh, couple of minutes here. So we got API gateway and you got um, some kind of pattern here with abstracting out the uh, Basically, you're, you're extracting out the microservice consumer uh, for an application, and so it can kind of make it easier to uh, call into your microservices. And then um, I'll go ahead and skip security since I'm kind of over time. Um, if you want to talk or have any questions, just uh, meet me, um, and that's it. Any que or I guess we have time for any questions or take a couple questions. It's Sean Vick, and uh, you uh, had mentioned that one of the things that complicates uh, the situation is that different organizations are uh, more uh, are less reluctant than other organizations. Right. And that uh, if you have a monolithic system, it's not obvious necessarily. <coughs> excuse me, how to break up the monolith. From a practitioner's point of view, do you know of any tools to help in that uh, dependency analysis? Who <clears throat> dependency analysis? Um, I know we we did one .NET uh, conversion, and it, there's this uh, .NET code called Independ, and I, I believe um, I believe class diagrams help a lot. A lot of tooling can help you uh, break down the class dependencies and things like that. What I would what I would really try to do is get business analysts and product owners to figure out their, their product dependencies. Um, but in a monolith, yeah, you can, you can try to pull out and abstract. Um, it would be really hard, I mean, if it's spaghetti code, right? Like, it could be really hard, and, and tooling would help for that. I imagine you could do an analysis on that with uh, 
I'm, I'm tooling, specifically but... interested in if people are doing uh, things with cluster analysis on you know, uh, call graphs and things like that to try to um, uh, automate the process or, or aid I the process have... of the analysts. Yeah, you probably could. Um, I've never done that. Usually the things I've worked at have been, luckily, had, had team <laughs> structures that supported it. In a monolith breakdown, that would be a challenge for sure. Um, but that's a good idea. That's a good point. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Um, you mentioned earlier that uh, duplication uh, or violation of dry is a side effect of uh, microservices. Can right. You elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. So an event sourcing system, you're storing facts. So the idea is if you have subsets of events in systems, the parts of the data of those events would be duplicated. But really, the microservice should only care about what it needs and what it's serving. So you wouldn't really be like third normal forming this data in your microservice. You could have a lot of data that is very similar between microservices and it would be duplicate. It could be stored. So an event source system could store uh, derivatives of the event data as structures in its own database. And then that, in a sense, you could look at the big picture and say, this thing has like a terabyte of data, and this has two terabytes of data. So we're only talking about uh, duplicates of duplication of data, not uh, code duplicates. Right. Yeah, duplication of data. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. All duplication right. of code is another good point. Yeah. And is that what you were asking about? Yeah. Okay. Duplication of code. Yeah, that's a good point. How do you share libraries, and how do you share code among microservices? And typically, I mean that that's a, a challenge is, is modular code. How do you create components in modular code? Um, you know. You look at the usability of something, and security is a big piece. Usually you would write a piece of security integration code, and you would share that among the different services. Because that's something you really don't want to home bake in each one. But the, the security logic, and I wish I could have got to that, um, using things like ZACML as an extens uh, extensible access control markup language is a, is a policy-based security framework um, standard that hasn't really got much industry adoption. But it's a really good standard for a lot of my enterprises use ZACML internally. Um, there's no frameworks for that, but that's a good way to, to have policy inside microservices, but applied using like a shared library. But yeah, that is, that is a good point. The cross-pollination of code, that could be a challenge. Um, All right, cool thing. And I have another question uh, regarding uh, version control of microservices. Um, are there any like uh, good practices or patterns that are out there for um, how to deal with uh, things like forward or backward compatibility. Um, right. Typically or... what I've seen is, you know, you, you wouldn't version services. If anything, if something's changing enough, you would just make a new one. Yeah, but and you may would, have duplicates. That um, would break. That might break. Uh... It could break. Uh, it really kind of depends, but typically I've seen things, people think things need to be versioned like that, and you could version like an API proxy and then change the backend service structure to kind of, you know, you kind of get into that thing where if, th if there's a lot of data centric in the service, then yeah, you would probably want to version and, and update it. And, but doing that, it, it can be tricky. But, you know, since it's so scalable and they're typically isolated, you could run older and newer versions side by side sharing the same data and then essentially, you know, coalesce or, or wean off the, the, the old users after they're done upgrading or things like that. Um, there's a lot of strategies around that. It's, it's very similar to how SOA would have worked. Um, with the exception that these are really small and usually they're so isolated and independent that you can have more than one of them and you can even have different versions of different ones running side by side. Uh, it really depends on the maturity of the organization and the ability to do backward compatibility and the format of the code. It really depends on a lot of specifics, but those are the general patterns and approaches that we would use. Okay. Well, thank you. You're, you're welcome. Yes, thank you. Uh, and a question about event sourcing yeah. uh, and sort of eventual consistency. Yeah. Um, say I had in the traditional system, I had a customer who wanted to like cancel a subscription, right. and I was just storing the current state of the subscription like on or off. Right. And something went wrong when they tried to cancel. It's pretty easy to return to them like a 500 or something, and just be like they would know they didn't actually cancel their subscription. Right. But in like an event sourcing system, where you just put on the cancel subscription event. Right. What if something goes wrong in the consumption of that event? You know, and then the customer left right. with subscription. So how that comes into kind of the issues? messaging pattern for how you do your event store and your, your event passing. Uh, and there's a lot of ways of, of solving that problem, but you know, durable queues, um, 
you know, handshaking and, and dispatching of, of uh, acknowledgements. I mean, it really kind of depends. And there's no real good framework for this yet. Uh, Eventuate is, is pretty interesting. I haven't actually looked at that, but I think it, it uses Java, but it, it kind of solved that problem in a distributed database kind of way, I believe. Um, but I don't want to misspeak, uh, but it's definitely worth looking into. Um, but yeah, you're right, like you need, you need to know that it made it in. And I think what you could do is write it and then try to read it. And if it didn't work, retry, something like that. I mean, that's typically what I would do in systems like that. But if, if you really, if it's so critical and you need something like that um, to be for sure, you might write to a local durable uh, resilient system and then try to do that. You know, there's, there's different kinds of ways, but there's always that boundary edge case where something could go wrong and what do you do in that case? And it's just how important is, how much, how much money do you want to throw at that kind of a problem? Um, but yeah, that's a very good example, good point. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, um, what is your uh, view on the uh, orchestration frameworks for microservices? What, what kinds did you encounter and your opinion of those? Uh, well, typically, um, I mean, there's, there's a couple different ones. Uh, I've, used, I've used a couple different ones. Basically, um, to me, I haven't really gone any one route uh, as recommending any, any of them. Um, only because to me, orchestration is, is a little heavy handed for the kinds of problems I deal with. I haven't had a case where we really needed heavy orchestration, where the user didn't already have something really crazy like BizTalk or something, and they were, they were afraid of orchestration after that. And so they, were, they would do anything but that. It's, it was kind of a hard sell to push orchestration. You really need a really mature organization to, to push those. And I might look into those more. I haven't actually used it, so I haven't used them very, very much, and I've done some prototypes with it. So I, I don't want to speak to that right now with, with any experience backing me up, other than just my, my opinion is um, typically I've, I've seen them be avoided. But not because they're not good, just I don't know, know enough about them to, to make a good argument for it, uh, for their, their business cases. All right, thank you.